This video is sponsored by Raycon. In an article titled, What is Hell? from R.C. Sproul, Sproul attempts to answer that question, writing, Hell is an eternity before the righteous, ever-burning wrath of God, a suffering torment from which there is no escape and no relief. Understanding this is crucial to our drive to appreciate the work of Christ and to preach his gospel. By that logic, I don't think the experience of watching the films that have come out of Illumination Entertainment is much different. You know, I don't like to be negative and talk down on things for the sake of talking down on them. Even when I poke fun at someone like Noah Centineo, or Gaspar Noel, or a movie like Dog's Way Home, I always feel, you know, a little guilty. At the end of the day, when you have a platform online, you gotta ask yourself, what am I achieving here? So far, I've run into two exceptions. One is Tom Hooper's 2019 film Cats, and the second is Illumination is not only the epitome of bad animation, it's the epitome of bad filmmaking. I know what you're thinking, another cis white man in his 20s on YouTube using his platform to shit on content made specifically for children, who needs it? Karsten, these movies aren't for you. If you can't tell already, I know, these aren't for me. These are for annoying children and parents who have been up since 6am and realized it's noon, it's a Tuesday, I don't know what to do with these kids today, so fuck it, three tickets for the minions, please. I don't know how to expand on this, but no meal goes better with these movies than the blandest, most overpriced AMC popcorn. AMC's popcorn tastes like bed sheets, and watching any of these is the visual equivalent. I watched all these movies and made a video about it because one, it's fun and I hope people enjoy watching it. Two, I've always agreed that watching bad movies is actually pretty good for anyone who wishes to either make films themselves or understand how to critically think about films. It's obviously a better time to watch Raiders of the Lost Ark and study the techniques Spielberg used to craft a perfect action movie, but it's also beneficial to look at something where you can put your basic knowledge to the test, answering why a film doesn't work at all, hypothesizing a better alternative. And three, for two years now I've been shitting on this company, but I've never dove deeper into what they've made. For example, when I reluctantly go to the theater to check out The Grinch and come out pleasantly surprised, it leaves me wondering, maybe they aren't that bad. But they are. The quote, they're just for kids, isn't an excuse at a certain point, because Meet the Robinsons is also just for kids, and that movie fucks way harder than it has any right to. Illumination makes bad movies, and to explain why, I watched all of them, and now I'm gonna talk about them. What better way to confront something you hate than by soaking yourself in that very content? We'll be starting from the top, moving down deeper into the fiery pits, confronting what are some of the laziest, most excruciating films ever animated. Now watching all these movies would have been absolutely hellish had I not had some comfortable, affordable, high quality wireless earbuds. So with that being said, I wanna thank Raycon Earbuds for sponsoring this video. Raycon sent me their everyday E25 model, and I gotta be honest, these are some amazing wireless earbuds. I really love the design, the bass on these babies is out of this world, and they pair seamlessly with all of my Bluetooth devices. I've been using them while writing my videos, they're super comfortable on long car rides, and whenever I wanna get a quick trampoline workout in, they stay in my ears. They have six hours of playtime, which is perfect for the six hours of backflipping I do on a daily basis. They also come in at half the price of other premium wireless earbuds. With all these color options, you're bound to find a pair that perfectly fits your style. And when it comes to fitting your ears, they got tons of sizing options, so that won't be a problem. If you want to get your own pair, you can go to buyraycon.com slash karsten, or click on the link in the description to get 15% off your order. In 2008, it was announced in a Variety article that Steve Carell would voice the title character in Despicable Me, the first film to come out of Illumination, Universal's family film unit. Two years later, that film hit theaters and we were introduced to the Minions, and they stuck around for, well, an entire decade. If there's one thing I gotta give Illumination credit for, it's that they created quite possibly the only thing besides Drake that managed to be relevant for the entirety of the 2010s. While Despicable Me would be considered bottom tier for both Pixar and DreamWorks, it's still a pretty solid family flick. I say that, but at the same time, I'll never forget seeing this with my friend in sixth grade and falling asleep 30 minutes in. After that screening, I was like, well, I guess I'm just too old for animated movies. But no, I was so wrong. It really is just a lot less interesting than every other animated film out there. But all of that aside, there's no doubt that this is their best. With the premise catering around a villain rather than your typical quote-unquote good guy, and it's about him stealing the moon, come on. That's fun, that's original. When this came out, minions weren't something where you shuddered the minute they popped up on the screen either. They were harmless, definitely not the best thing about the movie, but sure, they add some quirk. Compared to everything else Illumination has made, Despicable Me seriously is pretty hard to hate. But let me emphasize, while this is their best, it's nothing to write home about either.
As I mentioned earlier, the Grinch is seriously way better than it has any right to be. It's absolutely nothing special, not even close, but for what I was expecting, come on. To be honest, my worst experience with this film wasn't the film at all, it was the ad campaigns all over the city of Chicago. Signs like, I'm sure you'll catch the next one on train platforms, or green and salty just like my nuts, or my personal favorite, I'm gonna drown you to death in my green cum. It really helped me get into the holiday spirit. The argument, these are just for kids, holds up the best for the Grinch, and I think part of it has to do with the fact that it's a Christmas movie. The stupidity of it all, and the crude humor that Illumination tries so desperately to pull off actually feels fitting for this kind of movie. Dr. Seuss's Grinch was also one of my favorite things associated with Seuss, and that said, I think this film is pretty respectful towards the whole thing. If anything, it modernizes and lights up the city in a way that feels like a proper homage, but a new perspective altogether. But once again, it is still an Illumination movie. Not because it's obnoxious with its humor, which it is, but mainly because it's really boring after 20 minutes. I've talked about this in the past, but adapting children's books that worked because of their brevity and brief sparks of imagination and weirdness into films, it just does not translate. Again, I think The Grinch definitely comes through stylistically, it captures the magic, although I will say Benedict Cumberbatch gives a very odd performance. But as far as a narrative goes, it needed to do more work as a feature, which is a red flag to begin with because if there's one company whose creative input you do not want to hear from, it's Illumination. This is the first film on this list where we start to see a huge flaw in Illumination's catalog that happens way too often. And no, I'm not talking about sequels. There is barely a plot in a lot of these movies, and when there is a plot, it's either insanely generic or insanely disjointed. Despicable Me 2 is a very boring and unengaging movie. Charming? Sure, but also debatable. No film has ever made it more obvious that it is only here because its predecessor made a shitload of money. There's nothing new or exciting happening in this movie. There's barely any development, there's way more minions, it's like barely a step up in any way. Seeing as though the first film was pretty solid and entertaining, this is isn't the worst issue? Despicable Me as a franchise isn't irritating yet, but this film definitely makes you question why this of all animated films is getting milked as hard as it is. The whole appeal of the first one is grew bad, but maybe he learned to be good. Now he good, so why movie? I don't care about him saying Goyles again. It didn't need to happen. Because it's so lost, it really is just a collection of gags rather than a story. It'll take 10 minutes to set up an annoying joke that isn't bad, just irritating. And it'll do that just to fill time. I'll put it this way, I fell asleep three different times while watching this movie, I will never return to it. So their most recent film is The Secret Life of Pets 2, released in 2019. It's hard to talk about this in this order without mentioning so much about the first. There's also not a huge point, seeing as though these two films kind of just uh, blend together. The biggest difference is the voice actor for Max was replaced. The guy who voiced him beforehand did some bad, icky stuff, so they replaced him with the rat from Ratatouille. Definitely one of the better choices Illumination has made, and seeing as though Max is a very generic main character, it really didn't make a difference. Secret Life of Pets is, like, such an easy win financially. Even I I almost fell for the cuteness of some of these pets. Max, while generic, is very lovable, and Kevin Hart as the bunny was awful, but again, I can't deny how cute the bunny looked sometimes. People are gonna see this no matter what. That said, it makes sense for celebrities to sign on to something this profitable, which is why this movie is absolutely stacked. You have Patton Oswalt, Kevin Hart, Jenny Slate, Tiffany Haddish, Bobby Moynihan, Hannibal Burris, Nick Kroll, Pete Holmes, and Harrison Ford? Harrison Ford is in this movie, and he does a great job. Why is this dog the role this guy was born to play? Who do you play? What is that dog? I play Harrison Ford as yeah. a dog. <laughs> this and the first film aren't too different in my opinion, but this is definitely a slight improvement. For one, I think so much of the appeal of these films is just watching pets be goofy and cute, and this one embraced that a way more than the first. It feels like it says just a little something about dogs, just, just a little bit of meaning, a wee bit. But as a film, it simply just does not work at all for the same reasons that the first one doesn't, so let's just get right into that. Let me take you back to the summer of 2016. Things were great. Everyone was hanging out together, playing Pokemon Go, meeting strangers. Drake was at the top of his game. At this point, nobody knew he was a creep. You could listen to one dance guilt-free. The summer 2016 Olympics were in full effect. Ryan Lochte was getting himself in some mess. Amidst all that was a mediocre movie season. I mean, we got stuck with Suicide Squad and the Ghostbusters remake, the BFG. In the middle of a very eventful summer, Illumination dropped The Secret Life of Pets, and everyone was like, 
yeah, sure. The Secret Life of Pets is just a shittier Toy Story, and that's not the first time I'm gonna mention that in this list. Like, so much of the appeal of Toy Story isn't the idea that toys are different when they're alone, it's the relationship between Woody and Andy, the attachment of it all. In Secret Life of Pets, I don't even know what this person's name is. At first, I really didn't mind Secret Life of Pets, I actually found it to be one of the better films to come out of this company, but then Kevin Hart shows up, and everything comes crashing down. It's like you blink, and all of a sudden they're in a wiener fantasy. There is no film franchise as disjointed and as narratively incoherent as The Secret Life of Pets. Both the sequel and this first film are such a headache to follow. Why? Because there are so many fucking pets. It's like the Avengers, but they're throwing us right into Infinity War, and we have no idea who any of these animals are, we don't care, and they only have 90 minutes to work with, which is actually such a drag. I'm convinced these movies are as boring and as messy and as chaotic as they are because they needed to fill time, so they were like, uh, j let's just throw Hannibal Burris in. I mean, dude, the quote-unquote secret life of these pets isn't even that crazy. They just talk to one another. Why couldn't they have like an underground drug operation or something? Just stir the pot. Because of this, because of your lack of attachment, because a movie can't rely on cuteness, Secret Life of Pets may not be the worst, but it is most certainly one of the most boring. I will give it this. It's got a pretty nice jazzy score from none other than Alexander Desplat, and the use of light in the animation is definitely more interesting than it is in the other Illumination films. Conceptually, it could have been fun and harmless and cute. It could have been a murder mystery, apparently. But, oh well, at least Jenny Slate got a nice check out of this. Despicable Me 3 was the last film in this marathon, so I automatically went in not happy. But I didn't hate myself enough to not recognize this as, once again, not the worst thing in the world. I'll come right out and say it, but this film feels wildly unnecessary, go figure. At the moment it holds your attention and it does flow nicely, which may feel like the lowest bar you can go with a film, but trust me, that's better than most of these films can do. It just grinds my gears how effortless this film is. There isn't any attempt to do anything new or special, just bust out another Despicable Me movie and build that sweet and saucy lore to fuel 50 more more of these films. I mean, maybe I'm missing something, but here's what I realized like halfway through this. From what I can tell between this and The Secret Life of Pets, and fuck it, let's throw Sing in there, I think they're trying to sculpt the cinematic universe with these guys. I mean, I think they're trying to Avengers the damn thing, and as soon as they start feeling stale and stop making over a billion dollars, which clearly isn't stopping anytime soon, they'll morph these together into a shitty shared universe thing that'll go on for who knows how long. I mean, Gru does appear in The Secret Life of Pets, and so does Sing, I guess. Does that mean Sing the movie exists in that universe? Meh. Maybe that debunks the theory. But anyways, Despicable Me 3 introduces Drew, Gru's twin brother. It would have been hilarious if Steve Carell did his normal voice for Drew. I know it wouldn't make a lot of sense, but it would have been more interesting than him literally doing the same voice. The villain in this movie could not be less interesting. His personality is, I've been a bad boy, which is always like kind of weirdly sexual. He's barely given any backstory or character arc, he's literally just one of the many generic villains in these movies. Illumination treats Despicable Me like it's their toy story. See, there's the other one. It was their breakout hit, it works, it makes money, people love the characters, and they think there's a universe to work with. They don't understand that there isn't. There just is not a universe to work with here. The Despicable Me franchise is what the Toy Story franchise would have been if Pixar ignored the why questions and also just dragged the Martians out to death. I mean, seriously, come to think of it, the minions are just shittier Martians. But that why question is something most animated films try to answer. Why does this mean that? Why does that character do that? Pixar, DreamWorks, Leica, the best animation studios always explore reason through accessible, entertaining animation. Illumination does not bother. They just come with a bland story that could work for any modern blockbuster film and they plug their characters into it. Which is why even if they did have a universe worth exploring, they aren't doing anything about it. It's just Gru getting himself into situations where he has to fight the bad guy. The twist is Gru is also a bad guy, but that's the end of that idea. Plus after the first movie, once again, he's He's not a bad guy, so it's what's the point? Now, of course, they could do something like family and the influence your past has on your present and how that influences personality and growth, just some really basic themes of self-actualization. But hey, it's illumination. Just the very thought of having anything remotely meaningful and sustainable for a younger audience is completely thrown out the door. One, because it takes work, and two, because why spill all your beans in one good movie when you can spread a teaspoon of significance across 50 and make a shitload of money? From here on out, I really hate these movies. I always had a distaste for Illumination because of the minions, but never had a concrete reason to be against their films. I was always like, they're annoying, but they're not bad. But in 2018, when I had to suffer through the Lorax for my Dr. Seuss video, I realized, okay, these suck. I mean, where to even begin with the Lorax? I think there are three big things worth mentioning here. One, unlike The Grinch, the Lorax takes a steamy dump on everything that makes the original book so lovable and important. I'm not even talking about the message of the story yet, I'm talking stylistically. 
The Lorax film is so bland, so flat, so hideous, it's the loopy design of the original illustrations that makes the world of the story feel immersive and unique. There isn't a Dr. Seuss book that brings me into its setting quite like the Lorax. While open and abstract to an extent, it's also incredibly detailed. It's rich with color and texture, which is essential to making you feel like you're a part of this world. This movie, animation-wise, is barely a step up from the 2006 film Dougal. I cannot think of a lazier, more uninteresting approach to an adaptation. I don't know what the alternative is though, but there's a weirdness to the original that I don't see in this movie. The book always felt like kind of an outsider of Dr. Seuss's work. It was always a bit more mature and wasn't afraid to maybe break the rules and be its own thing. But the Lorax film, stylistically, is trying to be the most accessible thing possible. There's nothing outside of the box about this. All I'm saying is, just being colorful is not enough. Two, the message is completely lost. I mean, seriously, why even make the damn thing? If you're gonna completely ignore the Lorax's original critique on consumerism, and how we're destroying the environment, why are you making the film? To give you some backstory, in order to promote this film, Illumination decided to sneak the Lorax and its characters into different ad campaigns. One of them was a Mazda for a gas-powered SUV? <laughs> they came out and defended that this specific SUV was very fuel efficient and a solid alternative for those who can't afford electric cars. But really? You're gonna call a gas-powered SUV truffle a tree approved? This wasn't even the end of it. They also partnered with IHOP, Whole Foods, HP, Pottery Barn, Kids, and way more. For a story about how consumerism nearly wiped out the world where these characters live, it's just a bit silly how Universal spent 50 million dollars in product placement on the Lorax of all films. Sure, nobody watching this is going to actively destroy the environment even more because of the movie. Maybe this modern film adaptation will encourage a younger generation to treat the environment a bit better, I guess. But it's also just so aggressively tone deaf, it's hard to take any of this to heart from the company behind the minions. Three, lastly, how could I talk about the Lorax without talking about the Onceler? Now, I don't think the Onceler made the movie worse by any means, but it's certainly the most fascinating thing to come out of this film, so I have to bring it up. For anyone who is unaware of the Onceler, for anyone who wasn't on Tumblr, he's the villain of the film who almost brings down an entire ecosystem out of pure greed. Nothing too crazy, typical villain, but when this film brought him out of the shadows and he became a real person in a sense, a specific group of people on Tumblr grew obsessed with him, like an insanely dedicated fandom. User super high school level Dujan author has an essay commentary on this fandom where he writes, If you check the patterns, you'll see that the immediate characters and ships that everyone gravitates towards in any fandom are the most conventionally attractive guys that tend to be at the center of the work, but occasionally slightly off to the side. But the problem with the Lorax is that there really is only one character that fit that mold, the young Onceler. So in a furious attempt to create something out of nothing, one cest was born. The idea of shipping the young, innocent Onceler shown in the film's early sequences with his slightly older but still pretty more evil self that is portrayed in the How Bad Can I Be number. But what about the people who don't like that dynamic? What is there for them? Just one guy again. AUs upon AUs spawn for the million possible variations of one character and shipping them with the original and then shipping them with each other and ignoring the original and then creating alternate versions of those that are so wildly different from the original canon that they might as well be something else entirely. And it just became this huge Ouroboros of fandom desperately trying to justify its own existence that was inevitably doomed to basically eat itself. Oh, that was a lot to say. As you can tell, it was a huge thing. And I could go on for another 20 minutes on what this fan was, it was a huge deal, but we have three other movies to talk about. So, in short, while The Lorax was one of the most boring, uninspired, and toxic films to come out of the last decade, we sure did have some fun with it. Kinda tough to go from The Lorax to Hop. Because while Hop is a much worse movie, I really don't have as much to say about it. Hop was Illumination's second film, and it is, from what I know, their only live action film. Or partially live action. And thank fuck for that. Every bit of live action footage reminds me of something you'd see on the Hallmark channel, and all that animated footage is, what's the word, ugly? So when those two combine in the third act, you get something that looks like the worst case scenario for a Robert Rodriguez film. When we boil it down as far as a James Mardson driving in a car with a small animated creature universe goes, this is probably the worst. I guess we'll start there. James Marston is the only good and likable actor in this movie. I seriously can't think of a more unlikable and irritating voice for this bunny than Russell Brand. I mean, for fuck's sake, the tagline is candy chicks and rock and roll. Who out there was like, you know what the world is missing? An animated Easter movie centered around a rock and roll bunny. This movie would have been fine and passable had it been released in like 2005, but seeing as though it came out in 2011, it deserves to be shit on. As you can tell, I really don't have a lot of concrete reasons to hate this, I just do. It's annoying, it's corny, it's not funny, it's dated, it's hop. Seriously, that's the best title you could come up with, hop? So here it is, Minions, the one we've all been waiting for. At the end of Despicable Me, there's a post credit scene where the Minions are auditioning for something. It's that exact moment after a sequel that didn't need to happen where we as a society collectively said, 
why did we let this happen? That was Illumination's way of announcing this new Minions solo movie, and two years later, it really did happen. Here's what I'll say, it could be a lot worse. Like, it could be a lot worse. But don't get it twisted, this is still a chore to get through. Minions, like literally every other movie on this list, does not start off horribly. That is, of course, if we're ignoring the universal logo screen being sung by the Minions themselves. This one really does feel like a slow descent into hell. But moving past that, as soon as they really start to establish this as a prequel and origin story for the Minions, you're like, okay, interesting. I can appreciate the self-awareness it's going for, but after, let's say, 10 minutes, you are already more than done with watching this. The plot centers around the minions, Bob, Stuart, and Kevin trying to find a leader or boss or whatever. It's just, it's such a shitty way to start the movie. I do not care if these three creatures who do nothing but annoy everyone find their boss. But so they eventually go to VillainCon where they meet Stacy Overkill. I think that's her name. Stacy is definitely the most boring villain the company has ever made. The only thing she really has going for her is her dress, which is a rocket. So they like join her, but then she turns on them because they accidentally do better or something thing and there's a fight and then they just happen to meet Gru out of total luck. In short, as a prequel, this fucking sucks. We really learn nothing new about the minions. This story with Susan Overkill is completely unnecessary to the events that follow after this film. All I'm asking is what was this accomplishing? They rely entirely on small easter eggs that rather than being used creatively are just kind of like, oh we need to fill space with more bodies in the background so let's make one of those bodies young Gru. It's just lazy and boring. Even someone who does like the minions can admit this is a a good time because it really just feels like the same joke over and over again. With no progression whatsoever and an unconvincing plot, this really feels like a giant montage of silly minion moments that you'd find on YouTube. Not a movie. And lastly, we have Sing. Sing is, I'm serious, but it's everything I despise in a movie wrapped into one. If you've ever been to Navy Pier in Chicago, or the Mall of America in Minnesota, or Hollywood Boulevard in LA, this is the equivalent of those locations. Just gross, shallow, personality-less garbage soaked in formulaic pop music. Shit that screams, this only exists to pass time. I don't have that much against this kind of pop music, seriously, that's not the issue here. If you enjoy this music, I get it. Dynamite by Tayo Cruz, it kind of fucks. Some of it is pretty catchy. It's the fact that this movie just uses something like Billboard Hits, something already based on a boring formulaic plastic structure to fuel emotion. If this film is ever engaging to you, it's not because of the movie, it's because you're connecting with a song that already existed beforehand. It's like kids bop as a film. As a movie, there's really nothing relatable or inspiring about it. Every story beat is insanely cliched and has been done to death. This is doing close to nothing to reinvent the wheel. It's barely using the wheel to begin with. They were like, okay, so what is going to separate Sing from literally every other movie about making it in the business? Well, they're animals. If you replace these characters with humans, you'd lose cuteness for the kids. That's it. If you want to see funny animal gags and you're a kid, go watch Zootopia or even Chicken Little. Look how shitty the poster is. They're making a second one and look at that poster. <laughs> what could possibly happen in Sing 2? That's my question. Where are we going from here? But Karsten, it's a kid's movie. They don't need to reinvent the wheel. They don't need to be clever. They don't want to make anything more than passable and sugary and long enough to kill an afternoon. You're right. That is, not a joke, exactly what I think Illumination's goal was with Sing. To make some cash, entertain some kids, sugar-coated in shallow music to convince them they are being inspired when in reality you're just playing Firework by Katy Perry. The one thing you'll leave this film with that you didn't have before is I'm Still Standing by Elton John stuck in your head. It is a soulless 100 minutes and a waste of potential. In a time where the biggest animated films are coming from like four companies, one of which is nowhere near as financially successful as the other three, it just hurts to know that this is the movie where the the money and the talent and the exposure is going, something that I cannot emphasize enough will not do anything for anybody. Watching any Illumination movie is seriously like walking into a mall. Chris Melodondry walked into a Macy's once and was like, you, you feel what I'm feeling? You hear that Sam Smith song playing in the background? I'm gonna make an entire production company based on this feeling, and it's gonna make billions of dollars and lower the bar for animation in ways you've never seen. The expectations everyone over the age of 10 has for Illumination is on the floor, but they still rake in a lot of money. And with Minions 2, The Rise of Gru happening next summer, there really is no end in sight. I went into this video thinking I hated 
hate Illumination because of the cringiness, the obnoxiousness, because of how absolutely tone deaf they seem. But hey, if I'm gonna be honest, my mind has completely changed. I still really don't like what they do, but not because of any of that. It's because they're really taking up space with shallow, lazy work. They're like the nav of the film industry. They're producing candy, but unlike your favorite candies, nothing is there to keep you coming back for more. Children who grew up with these movies aren't gonna grow up and look back at them as a glimpse of childhood because there is nothing to grab onto. Nothing reached their minds when they first saw it. It flew by in bright colors. Pharrell songs, fart jokes, and white backdrops. A charm that relies on simplicity and stupidity and completely ignores any sense of heart. With all that said, thanks for watching. Go watch these films and form your own opinion. Don't forget to check out Raycon, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you.